Good evening, and welcome to Leesville First Baptist Church. We're continuing in our Bible study on the, in the book of Hosea, and we're up to chapter 5. Hear this, O priests. Take heed, O house of Israel. Give ear, O house of the king, for yours is the judgment. Lord, we know that you are a just God, but we have spent so much time depending on your mercy, on your grace, on your forgiveness, that often we forget just how just you are. That you will not abide sin in heaven, nor will you abide it on earth. Help us. We pray always for revival, but teach us that revival begins with repentance. And that if we do not repent, if we never repent, we were never saved. Help us. Because we would be different than the lost. Lord, we ask that you so work within us, leading us to revival, that we become a great people. Instead of begging for great things to be given to us or done for us, help us to become great people who take whatever you give us and wherever you place us and work for your glory. Teach us to be excellent, Lord, in all things. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're following up on chapter 4. In chapter 4, it was begun by saying that God was issuing a criminal charge against Israel. Today, we're continuing with the judgment, with the verdict. Christians cannot lose their salvation. But a church can lose all its Christians and thereby lose its salvation. A nation can lose so many of God's people that it's no longer a Christian nation, but it's a pagan nation. A damned nation. And it's part of our job as citizens of this country to make sure that we remain Christian in all our actions. The northern kingdom, Israel, is about to lose its salvation. Now, when I call it Israel, they did. When we think Israel, we think all the people of God, all the Jewish lands were Israel. At this time, the northern kingdom, the 10 tribes to the north, led by Ephraim because it was the biggest tribe, they were Israel. The southern kingdom was just the tribe of Judah. Now, I'm going to go ahead and uh, tell you what's, tell you the, the um, end of the book. Israel's going to be destroyed to the point to where there are now legends. What happened to the lost tribes of Israel? Well, they weren't lost. They were killed and they were scattered and then assimilated. Because they were pagan, assimilated into the pagan lands around them. In particular, Israel had made such, so many political deals with other countries that finally they made one with Assyria where the king of Assyria made, put demands upon them that made them support him in such a way that they essentially became Assyrians. And when they tried to rebel against that, he came, destroyed the northern kingdom, carted the survivors, survivors away into slavery. And because they didn't have a Jewish foundation, 
but at this point had already become mostly pagan, they were easily assimilated into, into Assyria, into the pagan lands around them. Only the Jews in Judah remained, and that's why they got that's how they got the name Jew, by the way, from Judah. So sometimes we believe that God will never let us fail because we're his people. The destruction of the northern kingdom is a, a glaring warning that that's not true. No, a Christian cannot lose his salvation. But a formerly Christian family, having lost its Christian members, can become lost. A church that formerly had Christians but doesn't any longer or has so few that they're of no effect or little effect, that church can lose its salvation. And a nation that called itself a Christian nation, even if it still calls itself a Christian nation, but has lost so many Christians that they're not effective enough that nation can be damned. When the Northern Kingdom finally did come back, they weren't Jews. They weren't even called Jews. They were called Samaritans in Jesus' day. And they were looked down upon because they used some Jewish terminology, but they were pagan at heart. So here's the... <coughs> Excuse me, here's the um, the verdict. Hear this, O priests. Take heed, O house of Israel. Give ear, O house of the king. Notice the three groups he's speaking to who are guilty. The priests, the supposed men of God, are about to have judgment cast upon them. The house of Israel, we expected that. The whole people of Israel are going to be judged. And, oh, give ear to the house of the king. The, the government is going to be destroyed. For to you, for yours is this judgment. Or in the Hebrew, you could translate that, to you is the judgment. Because you've been a snare to Mizpah and a net spread on Tabor. These were mountain areas, wooded areas, famous for hunting, but infamous for pagan worship. The pagans love to worship under the trees, out in the woods. They would trap people in sin through sexual sin. They would lure people into their worship. The devil does that today. We sell toothpaste with sex appeal. We sell middle-aged men cars by putting young beauties in them. The devil has always been about setting traps. And so God uses a play on words. He uses hunting images to tell this hunting area you're being judged because you laid traps. Young, good, impressionable young boys and girls were trapped by you, lured in, and you drew them into sin. Verse 2, the revolters, the rebels, are deeply involved in slaughter. Literally, they were deep in it. Though I rebuke, rebuke them all, even while I'm telling them this is sin, they're doing it. They're deep into it. I know Ephraim. Now, Ephraim's another name for Israel at this time because Ephraim was the biggest tribe of the northern kingdom. Judah was the biggest tribe of all. I know Ephraim, and Israel is not hidden from me. The word know here is an experiential word. I personally know Ephraim. I know what y'all are doing. I'm fully aware of what's going on with y'all. Israel is not hidden from me. 
For now, you, O Ephraim, you commit harlotry. Israel is defiled. The harlotry is a spiritual harlotry, yes, but it's but the word harlotry is appropriate because it was sexual sin. They would use their biggest sin was to take temple prostitutes. Temple prostitutes. Imagine a religious service based on sex where if you would go to the prostitute, pay some money, you could pray and be told that your prayers would be heard by God if you also engaged with the prostitutes. It, 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 it is so confounding that people, that priests, men of God, could engage in something like that. And yet that's what Israel was doing. This is the depth of sin. That even the holy places, even the temples, can become places of filth. They do not direct their deeds toward turning to their God. Now the word turning there could also be repent. What I'm interested in here is that the, the phrase in the Hebrew, they do not direct their deeds, can also be translated, their deeds will not allow them to repent. So take verse 4 either way you want to. Both ways are appropriate. They don't repent. Their deeds won't let them repent. They're so caught up in their sin, they can't repent. Like the rich young ruler who couldn't come to Jesus because his wealth wouldn't let him, they can't come to God because their sin won't let them. For the spirit of harlotry is in their midst. They are so eaten up by the sin of worshiping other gods and engaging in sexual filthiness that they can't turn to God. They do not know the Lord. Billy Graham is famous for the expression, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? That is a wonderful, wonderful uh, image of salvation. God says here they don't know the Lord. And the word know there is not the academic word know, but the experiencing word know. They don't have a relationship with God. Verse 5, the pride of Israel testifies to his, his face. Now, some people want to translate this, Israel's pride is getting in the way. And that's certainly true. But no, God is the pride of Israel. He says, you don't know the Lord. I am the pride of Israel, and I'm the one testifying in your face. I'm the one condemning you. I'm your pride. I'm your purpose. If you stand against me, you stand against your true self. Therefore, Israel and Ephraim stumble in their iniquity. Now, in the New Testament, the word stumble means sin. Here it means failure. Ephraim, Israel, fall because of sin. Judah also stumbles with them. What a horrible thought. Judah is about 100 to 150 years behind Israel in its coming destruction. Only Judah's was not complete. The Jewish people survived. A remnant did. But Judah stumbling because he's going to stumble with them. Like drunks, walk, staggering together. They're so besotted by sin that they're going to fall. They can't stand up. Verse 6. With their herds, with their flocks and herds, they, go, they shall go to seek the Lord. But they will not find him. Now, that seems to go against everything we believe about God. We're told 
those who seek God will find him. But not when they're going for the wrong reasons. Not when they're going with the wrong heart. Not when they're really not even trying to be saved. They hold up. Remember, they can't turn. They can't repent. But they're going to try to go to church and worship anyway. They're going to try to go to the temple and offer sacrifices anyway. As though they think they can have, have it both ways. So with their flocks and with their herds means they will go and perform sacrifice. And not a little sacrifice, not a, not a sheep, not a goat, but with flocks and herds. But they will not find God. He has withdrawn himself from them. God will never leave his people. That's his promise. I will never leave you nor forsake you. But we keep thinking that God has made that to a country, to a group. He makes it one to one. He has told you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But he could leave the United States. He's leaving Israel. Verse 7, they have dealt treacherously with the Lord. The same people who are going to go to make sacri make huge sacrifices to him have been treacherous towards the Lord. For they have begotten pagan children, literally strange children. Remember earlier, lo a me, not my people, not mine. These are strange children. They're pagan. Because mom and dad lived pagan lives at home, went to church and pretended to be Christian, the children are born pagan or born lost. And they show that when they grow up and leave the house. They have begotten pagan children. And that is, he notice how you put this together. They have dealt treacherously with the Lord because if they were faithful to God, they would have raised Christian children. But because they played the harlot, because they fooled around with other gods, they have children from other religions. Children who are lost instead of saved. Now, I'm not saying that every child of every Christian gets saved. But I am saying, if you did not teach Jesus Christ to your children, if you did not lead your children to salvation, if you did not lead them in a Christian walk, in a spiritual walk, teach them to pray, teach them to read their Bible, teach them to come to church, then you have been unfaithful to God. Now, a new moon shall devour them in their heritage. It has a double meaning. The new moon was both a, a Jewish and a pagan holiday. The very holidays that used to bless the Jews Is going to devour them. But also the pagan celebrations are going to devour them. Notice, and their heritage, children. Your children are your heritage. So you will wake up one day, Israel, and you will be pagan and not people of God. It's a horrible thought. You could wake up one day, America, and be an evil nation, pagan and lost. It's been said that when the Continental Congress struggled for days and days to come up with a constitution, when they finally came out with one, a woman was in the lobby and she asked Benjamin Franklin, what kind of government have you given us? And legend goes that Benjamin Franklin responded, A republic, madam. Pray that God gives us the sons to keep it. Great men and women have died for this country. But if we don't raise children who know about Jesus Christ, that we could throw away every sacrifice that those great people made.
verse 8, blow the ram's horn in Gibeah, or Gibeah, and the trumpet in Ramah. Now, when you blow the horn, blow the trumpet, you're calling people to war. Either you're warning them we're being attacked, or you're gathering them together so you can go, you can go attack. But the horns were blasted to tell everybody it's time to fight. Gibeah, for example, is where the tribes of, of all the kingdoms, all the, tri all the tribes got together to destroy Benjamin after Benjamin had committed horrible sin. Cry aloud at Beth Avon. And what are you going to cry out? Look behind you, O Benjamin. Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke. God is calling up the heavenly forces and he is going to destroy Israel. Now, he's going to work through sinful men and their armies are going to come down and, and fight against Israel, but it's the hand of God that's going against Israel. Among the tribes of Israel, I make known what is sure. God completes. God's the one who makes final. If God is doing judgment, it will be a final judgment. If God is doing justice, it will be final justice. And if God is working mercy, it's everlasting mercy. Verse 10, the princes of Judah are like those who remove a landmark, a thief who would move the landmark over so he can steal some land. Only in this case, they're moving religious lines that God has drawn. Oh, well, the line's here, but let's move it over here. That is the nature of sin. The devil likes to work in definitions. When the serpent asked Eve, did God say you couldn't eat from any tree? And she said, no, 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 just that one over there. He says, if we do, we'll die. And Satan moved the lines for her. Satan moves the lines when he leads you and me to sin. God says the line's here. Satan says, let's move it over a little bit. But here's the thing. Once you start moving it, it will move forever. Once you give in to sin, you will give in to more and more sin. The princes, the, we've been talking about the priests leading the people improperly. And by the way, a quick note, Paul warns us that preachers, pastors, ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ will be judged at a harsher level, a higher standard and we will receive a greater punishment. It's just something to think about if you're a teacher of the Bible. The government has been Israel. If the priests have been engaged using sex to make money and, and to make evil, the government is like those who remove landmarks. I will pour out my wrath on them like water. These people who move the lines. In Washington, you'll have groups that will take social norms and continue to move them. Destroying our nation in the process. God says, I will pour out my wrath on them like water. When communism fell, in Russia. It didn't fall because of a war. It fell because of a realization that the hand of God was against communism in Russia. And when communism is destroyed in other nations, it will go the same way with a realization of God's hand. And if whatever you want to call the sin in the USA today is addressed by God fully. 
it probably won't be with a military action against us, but just a realization that God's hand is against us. I will pour out my wrath on them like water. Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment because he willingly walked by human precept. He threw away the word of God and did what the rest of the world wanted him to do. We keep forgetting the lost die and go to hell. And yet somehow it's important to us to be like them, to please them. Peer pressure, why should we worry about peer pressure from people who are damned and headed to hell? But we do, over and over again. We live like sinners live, as though there's some kind of good in it. Therefore, I will be to Ephraim like a moth, and to the house of Judah like rottenness. Now, it's hard to translate this from the Hebrew. And all I can tell you is, this is calm and this is mild compared to the Hebrew. This is a, God says that I will be like to Ephraim, like a disgusting, cancerous rot, filthy and disgusting. I will nasty away the land of Ephraim, the house of, and notice the house of Judah. It is said that the Roman Empire fell because of barbarians, but the truth is the Roman Empire had, or, had already rotted away, and the barbarians simply came to pick at the pieces that remained. We can see the rot in history in other nations and I believe we can see that rot in the USA today. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, they stopped there for a second, because what should we do when we see a cancer upon us, when we see a wound? We should go to the doctor. In particular, we should go to the great physician. Ephraim, Israel, should have turned to God. But to continue reading, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent King Jerob, or Yerib. Now, history doesn't tell us of a king this name, but that's okay because the word Yerib there means avenger. It means a hero who would fight on your behalf. And we know this is what happened. The northern kingdom made political deals with Assyria. Come bail us out of our problems with, in particular, Syria. But some other nations throughout Egypt was giving them trouble. And he sent an avenger. Yet he cannot cure you. You need a doctor, not an avenger. You don't need a hero. You need Jesus Christ, Christian. We're always looking for that hero. We need Jesus. Ephraim needed God. And he was the one, the one that they would not go to. I believe because they knew it demanded repentance. He cannot cure you nor heal you of your wound. I will be like a lion to Ephraim. I will attack it and eat it up. Like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear them and go away. Tear them and go away. As much as I fear the punishment of God, I fear him going away even more. Tear at me, spank me, punish me, but don't leave me. That's always been my prayer. When Jesus hung upon the cross, the worst part of it 
was when he felt ne the need to scream, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God says, I will tear them and I will go away. I will take them away and no one shall rescue. Like a lion grabs his prey and carries it to his den, God says, I will carry them away and there'll be no one to rescue them because there's no honor among thieves. You've joined in, Ephraim, with the land of the pagans. See how much they love you when they don't need you. No one, none of them are going to come. You're expecting goodness from bad people. If you want goodness, you have to go to the source of good. Verse 15, a horrible verse. I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their sin. I'm going away and I'm not coming back until they repent. God goes away, we perish. God goes away, we waste away. God goes away, we are empty and we are purposeless and we are doomed. When God turns from us, we have nothing. When God turns from us, we are in hell. That is what hell is, a place of eternal forsaking. place where you will be you will be forsook you will be ignored by God abandoned by God forever destruction annihilation is preferable to this now that word expression acknowledge their offense which is the best translation I'll give that to our translators can also mean though until they become guilty it, or admit their, or bear punishment. I will, re I will return to my place until they accept their punishment. We want to repent and be punishment free. And God says, this is going to cost you. There's some crimes you can repent of, but you will still pay for it. If you have an affair with another woman, you can repent, but you could still lose your wife. You could still lose your family. And no amount of repentance will bring them back. Some sins come with punishment, even when they're forgiven. Then, I love the fact that God never leaves it completely black. Never leaves it dark. Then they will seek my face. In, the, in their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. Now, they sought him before, remember, with their herds and their flocks. But that was superficial. But now they're broken. They're broken to their core. They confess their sins. They acknowledge their guilt. They accept their punishment. And they turn to God. And they seek his face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me, it says. One of the mercies of God punishing us is that it brings us back to him. So many times we fight and run and to keep from being punished by God when what we need is that punishment. Are you willing to pray, Lord, lead me to repentance even if you have to take things away from me? Even if you have to break my heart? Even if you have to break my leg? Lord, take me back to where you want me to be, no matter how badly it hurts me. 
Because until you get to that point, you will not repent. Lord, punish me. Take a switch and beat me back out of the land of sin, back into your land. Take me because I'm yours. And I'd rather go into heaven with my eye poked out or gouged out than go into hell perfectly healthy. Are you willing to accept God's punishment for your sin? We don't want to hear that. But that's the question. If you are in sin, are you willing to accept God's punishment? And are you willing to let your loved one receive punishment from God knowing that that punishment is going to save them? Or are you going to fight God and keep your loved one from hurting, essentially keeping them in their their sin? The idea of spiritual adultery in Hosea with Gomer the prostitute representing Israel and re representing you and me is a powerful image that we're going to profit from, I believe, as we go through this Bible study. Until next week, in Christ's service and in yours, I am your pastor. Good night.